Hello, listeners. As an enhancement to your listening experience, I am now going to present these archive episodes unedited in their entirety, which includes all of my afterthoughts. So, continue listening after the outro music if you want to hear what I thought of the episode. And if you are enjoying the podcast, please support it by going to the homepage spacerockethistory.com and clicking on the orange donate button or the Patreon link. And now I can also accept Zelle and Venmo. Just use my email address, spacerockethistory at gmail.com. Thanks. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. In God's speed, John Glenn. Roger, zero G, and I feel fine. Can I feel out? Okay, I'm out. How does it feel for the United States to be the new record holder? At last, huh? When that baby lights, there's no doubt about it. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Houston, uh... Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Hello and welcome. This is Michael Annis, and you're listening to episode 268 of the Space Rocket History Podcast. And now, Apollo 13. Houston, we've had a problem. Part 3. Uh, Mission Control really did not get in the loop uh, and realize this was a real problem for 18 minutes. Uh, we had so many caution warning lights on, seven of them, master alarm and a blue computer restart light in addition. They assumed it was an instrumentation problem, that these were lights were false and not representative of a, of a real problem because they crossed systems, which were not connected in any way, and it just didn't seem possible that one failure would cause problems across that many systems at one time. And uh, in the interim, we were busy trying to just keep electric power because the explosion had closed valves on two reactant valves on two of the fuel cells, two of the three. So we were, I was switching buses. We had A, B, and C, and I was cross-tying to try to keep some, keep things up because uh, we we didn't have enough power. For the, we were fully powered up in the command module. So eventually, Mission Control uh, had that realization and also by then had recognized two things. One, that uh, we really had this uh, leaking tank, and furthermore, the second tank was starting to go down. They had better granularity in the readings they could tell before we did. And Jim Lovell had reported a stream of debris going away from the spacecraft, a flow, a flow of some kind in the sunlight, so that caught him up to say, this is not instrumentation, this is the real, real McCoy. And so they then got into uh, ferreting out uh, and, and settled some of the, the uh, warning lights because they realized they had telemetry to valves. And the G-shock of the explosion had closed some valves that were normally open in fluid, some fluid and, and uh, gaseous uh, systems, uh, flows. And so they had us recycle switches to reopen those valves, which we didn't, we couldn't see on our panel. And that made a lot of, uh, quite a few of those lights go away. It was were, were really not, it's not a real problem, just the valves had moved. So then we were wrestling with uh, mainly uh, how, to, how to save the second oxygen tank. Because uh, without that supply, uh, that, that remaining fuel cell was gone as well. It, fuel cells need oxygen and hydrogen to operate. And so it was a lot of troubleshooting for about an hour period of uh, trying to isolate the leak. Uh, and at the point, uh, it was obvious uh, run, we'd run out of ideas. That was Lunar Module Pilot Fred Hayes recalling how long it took for Mission Control to realize the problem was not instrumentation. It was 19 minutes after the explosion. In Mission Control, at the ECOM console and in the back room, Librigot and his support team of George Bliss, Dick Brown, and Larry Sheeks knew their options were extremely limited. 
to prevent the electrical system from shutting down completely, the ECOM could always connect the spacecraft's re-entry batteries to the two dead or dying power buses A and B. The batteries were great energy producers and should bring the craft back to full power almost instantly. The problem was the batteries would last only a couple of hours. If Librigot put the batteries to use now, Odyssey would drain the little power it would need for the plunge back into the Earth's atmosphere, provided it ever made it back to Earth. If Librigot didn't make this move, however, the problem could become even worse. When the remaining oxygen tank finally started to run dry, the ship would automatically begin making up for the loss of air and power by sipping, at will, from the tiny tank of O2 in the command module that was also used for re-entry. The official name for that tank was the Surge Tank, and its job during the hours and days of the flight leading up to re-entry was to compensate for fluctuations in the main oxygen supply, taking up excess gas if the pressure in the twin oxygen tanks climbed too high, or providing a puff or two of its own O2 if the pressure dropped too low. At the end of the mission, the oxygen in the surge tank would be topped off by the surplus in the presumably healthy main tanks, providing the crew with air for re-entry. But, with Tank 2 dead and Tank 1 dying, Odyssey would eventually bleed its surge tank dry. The only answer was to connect the batteries briefly to prop up the dying power buses A and B, and then begin reducing power use as fast and far as possible. This at least might ease the demands on the remaining fuel cell and delay death of the oxygen and electrical systems until a better answer could be found. At the same time, the ECOM was coming to this realization, his back room was reaching it too. Sigh, Dick Brown said into Librigot's headset. I think we're going to have to throw a battery on bus B and bus A until we psych them out. I agree, Librigot said. Let's do it. Also, Brown added, I think we ought to start powering down. Yeah, Librigot said, then dialed up the flight director's loop. Okay, Com, I'm coming back to you. Flight. Go ahead. <clears throat> uh, I think the best thing we can do right now is start a power down. Okay, uh, let's go down the, the emergency 1-5. You Just want to power down, go. let us look at the TM and all that good stuff, and yeah. then come back up. That's right. Liber got thought to himself, come back up? Krantz wanted to know if this ship could come back up? No, he wanted to tell him. The way it looked now, this ship was terminal, and it was never coming back up. But Krantz and Liebergott's jobs precluded, at least for now, a discussion like that. It was Krantz's responsibility to download the mission carefully, and it was Liebergott's job to provide him the best possible spacecraft to do it with. Okay, what do you want to go to uh, power down? Give me the stage. Uh, emergency 1-5 flight will go down, uh, try to get a delta of 10 amps redu reduction. A total of 10 amps. That's firm. Okay. The entire spacecraft was pulling only about 50 amps. Librigot was suggesting pulling the plug on 20% of its systems. Krantz punched up his comm loop. Capcom, we'd recommend uh, emergency power down checklist 1-5. We want to power down a total or a delta of 10 amps from where we are now. Flight in. Lovell looked at his crew and smiled a tight smile. The commander and his crew knew that this mission, at least the way it was originally planned, was over. However, they also knew that Houston would have to reach that conclusion for themselves. It sometimes took mission control a while to catch up with the pilots on these issues. But the power down order was the first suggestion that mission control was coming around. Lovell nodded to Swigert and the command module pilot pushed off toward the lower equipment bay to retrieve the emergency checklist. 
Mission protocols and flight plans were typed on fireproof sheets of paper and arranged steno book fashion between two cardboard covers held together by two metal rings. Books containing non-critical procedures were stowed in storage cabinets around the ship. Those with more vital procedures were secured by Velcro strips to handy spots on the walls of the spacecraft. The power-down checklist was contained in one such book. Swigert found it in the equipment bay, tore it off the fabric anchor, and carried it back up to the couches. Did you copy our uh, power-down request? All right, Jack, we're, uh, uh, yeah, we're there right now. Where did you say that was located, Jack? That's in your uh, systems checklist, page 1-5. I'd also check for those pages in your uh, launch checklist. They're uh, emergency pages, pink pages, 1-5, and uh, we'd like you to power down okay, until you okay, get the launch, the launch okay. checklist, Jack. Roger, uh, power down until you get a amperage of 10 amps less than what you got now. Over. Okay. As Jack Swigert begins shutting down the first of the dozens of systems that the pink emergency pages instructed him to do, Chris Kraft pulled into the parking lot outside Building 30, the Mission Control Building. While Ecom watched his readings continue to fall, Librigot asked Krantz to power down some more. Flight Ecom. Go oh, Ecom. Uh, we've really got to get that battery off the line and power down some more. And uh, we've got to get some main B power back so we can uh, build our pressure back up in O2 Tank 1. It's uh, down to 318 PSI. See, with Battery. main B down, we have, no, uh, we have no heaters in O2 tanks. Hey, what do you want to power down? Well, where do you say you got down to? BMAG 2 off, not inclusive? That's affirmative. BMAG 2 is in warm-up. I think we'll go ahead and turn that down. We have, still have the limb with us, right? That's affirmative. So, uh, if we shut down the SCS, we ought to be a little better off, perhaps. I think we ought to press on and go down through BMAG 2 off and get those lights minimum. Okay. How much you want to power down another 10 amps? Let's go delta. get the BMAG off and get the lights down to a minimum. Let's go down two more steps. Okay, Capcom, we want to power down a little bit more. We want to get the BMAG off and lights minimum there. 13, this is Houston. Uh, we'd like to power. The BMAG they were referring to was the body mounted attitude gyro. Flight Econ. Go Econ. Let's uh, take battery A off the main. We can support the. Uh, that's fine. Now in the one fuel cell, even with the uh, Cryo 2 going down? That's, that's a firm flight. Okay. What's your worry level on Cryo 2? Say again, flight. Okay. You want to. I want to save the battery flight. Okay. Let's see, what battery have we got online, Si? Say again. What battery have we got online? Battery Alpha Flight. Battery A, okay. And the next step, of course, we'll uh, then think we got to worry about getting some power on main B to get the pressure back up in O2 Tank 1. Roger. Turn battery A off, Capcom. As the O2 continued to vent, Ecom decided it was time to save the surge tank for re-entry. Flight Econ. Go Econ. Let's have them isolate the search tank also and save it and we use the cryo as much as we can. Uh, say that again? Let's isolate the search tank Why in that? the command module. I don't understand that, sir. I don't want to, I want to use the cryo as much as possible. But that would seem to be the opposite if you want to keep the fuel cell going. The fuel cells are fed off the, uh, the tanks in the service module flight. The search tank is in the command module. We want to save the surge tank, in which we need for entry. Okay, I'm with you. I'm with you. Roger. Capcom, let's also isolate the surge tank. Back in the spacecraft, Lovell drifted over to the center of the command module to get a reading on his remaining oxygen tank and see how much of a margin of error it would provide him. If the engineers had planned it right, the crew would arrive back home with a substantial load of O2 to spare. Jim glanced at the meter and froze. The quantity needle for tank one was well below full and visibly falling. As Lovell watched, he could see it easing downward 
in an eerie slow motion slide. This discovery, scary as it was, explained a lot. Whatever happened to Tank 2, that event was over. The tank had gone offline or blown its top or cracked a seam or something. But beyond the very fact of its absence, it had ceased to be a factor in the functioning of the ship. Tank 1, however, was still in a slow leak. Its contents were obviously streaming into space, and the force of the leak was no doubt what was responsible for the out-of-control motion. It was nice to know that when the needle finally reached zero, Odyssey's oscillations would at last disappear, but so would its ability to sustain the life of the crew. Lovell knew Houston had to be alerted. The change in pressure was subtle enough that perhaps the controllers hadn't noticed it yet. The best way, the pilot's instinctive way, was to play it down, keep it casual. Okay, Jack, are you copying uh, O2 tank 1 cryo pressure? That's affirmative, and uh, we're trying to get uh, power to that tank. Stand by, we're working on it. The emergency power down and the battery hookup, while relatively extreme measures to hold the disintegrating power system together, were apparently not working. On Cy Libergott's screen, the readouts now revealed that the pressure in tank 1 was down to a mere 318 pounds per square inch. Keep in mind, the oxygen tanks need at least 100 psi to feed the gas through the lines and out to the remaining fuel cell. Once another 218 pounds bled off, the precious bit of gas left in the tank would be useless. As near as level could tell, it would be a while before the ship's end game would play out. He had no way of calculating the leak rate in the tank, but if the moving needle was any indication, he had a couple hours at least before the 318 pounds of oxygen were gone. When the tank gasped its last, the only air and electricity left on board would come from a trio of compact batteries and the surge tank but these were intended to be used at the very end of the flight when the command module would be separated from the service module and would still need a few bursts of power and a few puffs of air to see it through re-entry the surge tank and the batteries could run for a couple of hours combining this with what was left in the oxygen tank odyssey alone could keep the crew alive until sometime between midnight and 3 a.m. Houston time. It was now 43 minutes since the crisis began. But Odyssey wasn't alone. Attached to its nose was Aquarius, with no leaks and no gas clouds. An Aquarius that could hold and sustain two men comfortably, and in a pinch, three men with some jostling. No matter what happened to Odyssey, Aquarius could protect the crew for a little while anyway. From this point in space, Lovell knew a return to Earth would take about a hundred hours. The lunar module had enough air and power only for the 45 or so hours it would have taken to descend to the surface of the moon, stay there for a day and a half, and fly back up for a rendezvous with Odyssey. And that air and power would last 45 hours only if there were two men aboard, but another passenger inside, and you cut that time down considerably. Water on the lander was similarly limited. But Lovell realized that for the moment, Aquarius might offer the only option. He told his crew, if we're going to get home, we're going to have to use Aquarius. Back at Mission Control, Libergott had discovered the falling pressure in Tank 1 at about the same time Jim Lovell did. Libergott turned to his right, where Bob Hesselmeyer, the environmental control officer for the LIM, sat. At this moment, ECOM 
and his lunar module counterpart could not have been in more different worlds. They were both working the same mission, both struggling with the same crisis, yet Libergot was looking out from the abyss of a console full of blinking lights and sickly data, while Hasselmeyer was monitoring a slumbering Aquarius beaming home not a single worrisome reading. Chris Kraft arrived as they were starting the second phase of the power down of the command and service module. Kraft made his way down the tiered theater-like incline of the control room to Krantz's third row console, where the flight director looked up and told Kraft, Krantz, we're in deep S-word. Kraft then moved a few feet away, plugged his headset into his own console, and dialed up the air-to-ground loop and the flight director's loop to see what he could learn. With the exception of the Gemini 8 abort five years before and the Apollo 1 fire three years ago, Kraft had never heard a flight director keeping so many balls in the air at once. Libregot signaled the next phase of the withdrawal with a simple suggestion. Okay. Flight Econ. Go ahead, Econ. The pressure in O2 Tank 1 is all the way down to 297. We better think about getting in the LEM or using the LEM systems. I'm going to have to power way down. I don't know if I'm going to be able to save the O2 for the third fuel cell, for fuel cell 2, rather. The heaters aren't working now. Let's start thinking circuit breakers. You got any circuit breakers you want to check there? Yeah, we We saw the current flight. You saw the current. Okay, right. look, let's look, check it anyway, Floyd, you're right. It looks like it's cycling up a PCM count from 297 to 302. Okay. Give me some circuit breakers to check. Okay, uh, panel 226. Cryogenic O2 heater 1, main A circuit breaker. Tank 1. Tell me you from flight. Go ahead, flight. I want you to get some guys figuring out minimum power in the LEM to sustain life. Roger. Okay. On Libergot's screen, the remaining oxygen was now below 300 pounds per square inch and falling at a rate of 1.7 pounds per minute. Working with pencil and a scrap paper, Bliss performed some quick calculations. He estimated that in 1 hour and 54 minutes, the tank would fall below the critical 100 psi and from then on be useless. Moments later, Libregot began to relay the bad news to Krantz. See that juice is still going down there, Econ. Got any more suggestions? Flight Econ. Any more suggestions in trying to pump up O2 tank 1 pressure? No. Uh, flight, we're going to hit 100 PSI in uh, an hour and 54 minutes. That's the end right there. Okay, 100 PSI. Less than two hours now. Libregot did have a final alternative. He could have the crew shut the reactant valves on the two defective fuel cells. The reactant valves regulated the flow of oxygen from the cryogenic tanks into the cells. If the leak that was killing tank 1 could not be found in the body of the tank or in the gas lines that ran from it, perhaps it was located downstream in one or more of the dead cells. Shutting off the valves would either stop the O2 venting, allowing Odyssey to stabilize itself and power back up, or it would do nothing at all, allowing the controllers to give up on the ship altogether and turn to other survival plans. But shutting down the reactant valves was a decision from which there was no turning back. The valves were such delicate, precisely calibrated bits of equipment that once shut, they could not be reopened without a team of technicians to adjust them and tweak them and certify them fit to fly. Since mission rules required three healthy fuel cells for a lunar landing, Libregot knew that the suggestion he was planning to make would, in effect, be a formal acknowledgement that the mission was aborted. Flight Econ. Go ahead, Econ. Okay, listen, there is a possibility that we blew uh, 
a O2 line in one of the fuel cells, and it's effectively manifolded there, of, of course. Now, uh, I'm, I want to shut off one of the, rea the reactant valves to one of the fuel cells, and that would be fuel cell 3, since its O2 pressure is gone. Now, fuel cell 1's O2 pressure is trying to stay up there at 45 PSI. Maybe the problem is in fuel cell 3. That sounds lost. like a good assumption right there. Yeah, fuel cell 3 is lost anyway as far as flight GNC. Okay, 13, this is Houston. It appears to us that we're uh, losing O2 flow through uh, fuel cell 3. So uh, we want you to close the react valve on fuel cell 3. It looks like fuel cell 1 and 2 are trying to hold up okay. You copy? Uh, you're saying uh, fuel cell 1 and 2, uh, 1 and 2 are trying to hold up, but uh, we're leaking O2 out of fuel cell 3. And you want me to uh, shut the react uh, valve on fuel cell 3. Did I hear you right? That's affirmative. Uh, close the react valve on fuel cell 3. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll go to the SSR page. Uh, you want me to go through that whole smash for uh, fuel cell shutdown. Is that correct? Okay, 13, uh, we want you to uh, turn the inline heaters off on fuel cell 1. Then we want you to go through the fuel cell shutdown procedure on fuel cell 3. Read back. Okay, shut down the inline heaters on fuel cell 1. We're proceeding with the shutdown special subroutine for fuel cell 3. That's affirmative. Hayes turned to Lovell and nodded sadly. It's official, said the astronaut who until just an hour ago was to have been the sixth man on the moon. It's over, said Lovell, who was to have been the fifth. At the ECOM console and in the back room, Libergott, Bliss, Sheeks, and Brown watched their monitors as the valve in fuel cell three was closed. But the numbers for Oxygen Tank 1 confirmed their worst fears. The O2 leak continued. Salutations from the foothills of North Carolina. This is Michael Annis, your host. And I wanted to say thanks for listening to episode number 268 of the Space Rocket History Podcast entitled Apollo 13, Houston, We've Had a Problem, Part 3. I hope you enjoyed this episode. It was a pleasure to bring it to you. I want to give a big shout out to all my longtime listeners. Thanks for staying subscribed and extend a warm welcome to my new listeners. I'm glad you're here. Today, we salute our Orion level donors. There are 32 so far this year. Orion donors contribute $100 or more during the calendar year. Thank you so much for your continued support, Orion donors. Okay, I had a few thoughts about this week's episode. First, I want to credit my sources. Lost Moon by Jim Lovell. A Man on the Moon by Andrew Chaikin. Failure is Not an Option by Gene Krantz. Flight by Chris Kraft. The Apollo 13 Flight Journal the Internet Archive, and Wikipedia. Well, we are at a little over an hour past the explosion, and just about everything they tried, in fact, everything they tried, didn't stop the oxygen venting into space. The command module is essentially bleeding out, and it is nearly dead, and they are heading away from Earth. How are they going to get back? The limb is their only hope, but the limb is only for two men and 45 hours of breathing. By this time, the astronauts were almost certain they weren't going to walk on the moon, but maybe they held out a little hope they would at least get to orbit the moon. When Mission Control told them to shut down Fuel Cell 3, they were pretty devastated. This meant that practically the whole mission was aborted. It was official now. No moon landing 
no orbiting the moon. It was survival, and they were quickly running out of oxygen. A scary prospect when you are 200,000 miles from home, heading in the wrong direction. You may have heard that there was a small conflict in how long it took Mission Control to realize the problem was real, not just an instrumentation problem. Krantz wrote in his book it was about 15 minutes. Now you heard Hayes on the audio clip say that it was 18 minutes. But in this case, Krantz is a little more accurate with the 15 minutes because it matches the transcript of the mission. Okay, I have posted some pictures and the audio for this episode on my homepage, spacerockethistory.com. Hope you check that out. We were pleased to receive five donations to support the podcast over the past week. Paul P. from Melbourne, Australia donated at the Apollo level and earned his rocket emoji. Lawrence W. sent in another donation this year and was moved to the Soyuz level with rocket emoji. Murali S. from India donated at the Mercury level. Jeff R. pledged on Patreon at the Apollo level. Noah V. pledged on Patreon at the Soyuz level. Well, during the dog days of summer, our Patreon donors are at 185. That is a new high. The goal is to reach 218 by the end of 2018. Our total donors are at 323 with a goal of reaching 418 in 2018. I am so grateful that the number of Patreons have gone up this month. That is excellent. I appreciate it so much. On the other hand, unless something changes quickly, August funding will be the second lowest this year, and it will be substantially lower than August 2017. For those of you who are enjoying the content provided here and have not donated yet in 2018, please consider supporting the podcast if you are financially able. Keep in mind, Space Rocket History is entirely listener-funded, so I depend upon your financial support to keep the podcast going, especially during the dreaded dog days of summer. To support the podcast, go to the homepage, spacerockethistory.com, click on the orange Donate button to make a one-time donation, or the Patreon link to make small monthly donations. All donors are rewarded with their name on the donors page at the level they choose to donate. For those of you who have already donated in 2018, I certainly appreciate it. This week, we're giving away the official Space Rocket History logo magnet. It is 3 inches in diameter, round, and will stick to most refrigerators. To select the winner, Mrs. SRH gave every 2018 donor a number. Then she put the range in Google's random number generator and got the number four, Scott Young. Scott Young, if you would email me, mike at spacerockethistory.com, and tell me your address, I will mail this out to you. Okay, folks, that's all I have this week. I will try to get episode 269 out by next Thursday. So long for now.